And now we're super excited to bring in uh, my partner in crime at Music Policy Forum, Anna Chalenza, and Heather Noonan from the League of American Orchestras. Um, that was fun. That was great. That was great. And I love that she's breaking down some rituals that we've all gotten in the habits of in these different genres. It's fun. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's only visible to panelists, but uh, Des is getting some love from the viola section in the audience there. So shout out from viola players. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Heather, let's talk, let's just create a little bit of context in terms of who you are and what you've been doing, you know, in Washington with advocacy and, and stuff like that. Can you just start big picture and talk a little bit about the League of American Orchestras and, and what that organization does and your role in it? Yes, sure. Uh, so the League of American Orchestras is the national service organization for all symphony orchestras in this country. Uh, and we know there are about 1600 of those nationwide. And that includes about 400 youth orchestras. Uh, also to give you a sense of the variety we have within that membership, two thirds of professional orchestras have budgets of under $300,000. So I know that that kind of gets you into a different frame of mind about what's the range of organizations that are supporting a really large workforce of musicians and also serving really communities everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, nearly everywhere you'll find a community, you'll find a community orchestra. Um, so we do the things that most national service organizations do. We convene all the stakeholders within that field. We do research and data, um, but we also do advocacy. Um, and primarily at the federal level. Uh, we also help equip that network of people to become active advocates in their own communities as well. And every single bit of advocacy we do is done in partnership with the broader art sector and also our collaborators in the broader nonprofit sector. So that kind of brings me, I think, to, you know, one of the reasons the League is here today is actually because of our role as a collaborator across the network of federal arts advocates and that puts us at the table with, you, you know, you named the organization, you named a few of them that have been created just in the wake of this pandemic mm -hmm. uh, to try to identify a policy platform that we could collectively advance to Congress. Um, and we're, of course, at a really unique moment right now where we have um, ongoing federal policy issues that need attention in a new Congress and a new administration. But we also have layered on top of that all of these new urgent needs related to COVID relief. Um, and so I, I, I liked Dessa's phrase around, you know, laying track as the train is going. Uh, that's kind of where we are with the COVID relief scene. You know, a lot of this is all new, new forms of relief that have never been created before. So can, can I jump in with a good question to, to build off of that and some great work that you all have done. And um, that has to do with your um, arts education advocacy. I mean, you mentioned that there were youth orchestras and everything else. Um, be, even before COVID, there, there was already uh, clear awareness that there were inequalities, right? There were some public schools that had very strong music programs and then others that weren't to the point that um, sometimes it, it's even talked about as being a civil rights issue. And so could you talk about some of the things that now, especially that COVID's happened and money is even crunched all the more, what are, what are some recommendations you have for all of us that to, to kind of help move the train along to make arts education not only important, but equally distributed? Yeah, it's such a key issue, especially as we look ahead to who gets to participate in these art forms, both as a profession and even in their personal lives. So we know for decades, there's been this massive inequity in access to arts education in the public school system. And I would say, you know, for the last 20 years, there's been no question about the benefits of arts education for every student's success in school, work and life. So there's a strong foundation of research. We don't even have to argue the case that it's important to have. The question is, can you prioritize funding this and making it accessible for every school kid? Mm -hmm. um, and so the last time, it's been way too long since we've had a national snapshot on the status of arts education in the schools. But when this happened under the Obama administration, the results were absolutely clear. The highest poverty schools had the least access to arts education. And then Secretary Duncan said in the, the press conference with this release said, this is absolute proof that the status of arts education in the schools is a civil rights issue. Um, so what does that mean for federal policy? Uh, well, the role of federal policy in public education is to level 
that accessibility. Um, that's why the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was created, was to address civil rights issues in public education. So the, the two biggest things that we're focused on right now is um, reminding everyone that 90% of education policy is made at the state and local level. So if this is an issue you care about, it's really worth getting active with that, you know, at the school system level, at the state level, and the Arts Education Partnership, which is a national collaboration across the National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Department of Education has terrific resources to get folks plugged into those policy conversations at the local level. Um, but the other is that we really, uh, we would need the U.S. Department of Education to help put arts education back, back on their map. They need to collect data about the status of arts education in the schools. And this is something they can decide to do without an act of Congress. This is a decision the administration can lead right away. So that's one area we're focused on. Um, the other um, just really quick thing is that Title I funds are meant to serve these schools that need to have a more level playing field for all kids in all parts of education. And they can be used for the arts. So we need, again, that really clear message. The arts are a core academic subject of learning, and you can use Title I funds to support them. Oh, well, that's great. Thanks. Um, do you have a question, Michael? I got another oh, one. Yeah, keep going. So I have another one. So another one, and this is an issue that perhaps we haven't had to deal with during COVID because no one can travel, but something that you all do that, that I think is often forgotten or not noticed is um, artist mobility. It's really hard when you're bringing over a guest artist from a foreign country. And so could you talk about how you help sort of um, streamline that process of artist mobility? Sure, and again, we have terrific partners in this along the way too. Um, so again, with the help of the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, many years ago, we were able to get off the ground a website called artistsfromabroad.org. And it's actually become, it's not just for orchestras, it's for all art forms. And it's become the only place to go really to understand how to do the US artist visa process if you can't hire an attorney to get through the visa process for you. So it covers everything from completing the forms all the way to the US tax process for that artists have to comply with once they get here. And the problem is that the artist visa process has always been unreliable. <laughs> Um, and very often, and especially now, unaffordable. And the chilling effect that that has on international artistry, international cultural collaborations, um, even our economy here, and the work that US artists wish to do alongside their international counterparts has been really challenging. Uh, so we work kind of on both sides at the same time. One is this technical assistance, um, and our friends at Tamazdat. Uh, if you don't know Tamazdat, be sure to get to know them a fantastic collection of attorneys who, who do this 24 hours a day. Um, we partner together through our resources to help folks get the visas as best they can. And then at the same time, we're working to try to improve the policy. Great, thanks. So Heather, I, something we've been doing a lot in this program is kind of going through this thought exercise of um, you know, we obviously have to engage in the, the immediacy of the moment and the crisis and relief and just sort of the unprecedented thing that we're dealing with. But we also need to recognize that people like you and I have done this work for a long time because there are these broader needs and you addressed a bunch of them, you know, kind of recently. And I would love to, you know, dig in a little bit in terms of as you're thinking about your advocacy agenda, as you're thinking about, you know, sort of the big picture, you know, sort of macro challenges or opportunities for the constituency you represent, you know, pre-COVID, you know, what would you have anticipated would have been the big priorities beyond kind of the education piece you're talking about? Are there sort of bigger picture structural things that were on your radar that you were you were engaged with? Um, like what would have been the kind of the agenda rolling into 2020 if we hadn't had COVID? Oh, wow. Uh, it's big. I'll be honest with you. We, we had just come off of uh, international treaty negotiations around transporting musical instruments mm -hmm. across borders that they have you know, specialized woods and that sort of thing. It was a completely different scene. Yep. Um, but, you know, the other issue, yeah, the, the arts education issue is perpetual, really. 
Um, obviously focused on trying to increase resources for the dedicated cultural agencies, um, NEA, NEH, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services, another perpetual issue. Uh, we spend a lot of time on tax policy. So I'm extremely jealous of Dessa's connection to the Treasury Department right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is like the stuff of dreams for, for advocates like me. Uh, so, you know, um, and we look at it in a couple of different ways, you know, charitable giving incentives are really critical for the nonprofit arts sector. And uh, we know that individuals give first and foremost from the heart, right? Uh, who they give to and when they choose to give, you know, is very influenced by that. But also how much they give can be really sensitive to tax policy. So one of the things that was on our agenda before COVID that might not have advanced if it weren't for COVID was this idea of a universal charitable deduction. Mm -hmm. So now that we have so many taxpayers who no longer itemize after the last comprehensive tax reform, they lost that tax incentive to give more. Uh, and the nonprofit sector was working hard to try to get this idea across the line. Shouldn't every taxpayer get an incentive to give more? Um, and it didn't really come through until the COVID relief package. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a you know, relatively modest, but very important universal charitable deduction created there. Uh, it was extended in the last relief bill for the rest of uh, this year. And you know, we're working to try to make it permanent. It, it kind of reminds me you know, when you're talking about you know, eligibility for gig workers for unemployment. Again, it was... Uh, I don't think that was something that we would have been advancing, right? Absent this in the specific way that we did. And it's a benchmark to have it there. But looking ahead now, we need to ask, how can we make this recognition of the multiple ways that creative workers work permanent? Yeah. And how can we get it into other places in federal policy beyond these you know, limited relief packages? So you, you spoke about that earlier, but let's dig down a little bit deeper. I mean, the, the notion of the kind of cross-discipline sort of collaborative work that you've done through the cultural advocacy group. I mean, could you spell out a little bit more, like what is that meant to, you know, approach Washington less from kind of a zero-sum game where everybody's just fighting for their own sort of, you know, peculiar interests versus like, okay, how do we try to carve out something more holistic and intentional that, that you know, will lift everybody. And, and so talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about cultural advocacy group, but also sort of where, you know, where that work is, like what, what's happening with that, that network at this point. Yeah, sure. Um, so don't bother Googling the cultural advocacy group because <laughs> there's no website, there's no dues. It, it only exists in our own imagination, but it's basically like a round table where arts advocates at the federal level sit together to think about how we can collectively advance a common agenda. Um, you know, on the Hill, they don't really see the arts as 23 different things. Um, and basically our first goal is that they see the arts, mm -hmm. right? That they think about it and that they're consciously aware that their policy making will impact the arts sector. Uh, so the primary goal of this group is to try to articulate some clear priorities we can draw to the attention of Congress and now especially the administration and federal agencies and to advance this with a unified voice so that if they're hearing from multiple different um, parts of the arts sector, it all adds up to, you know, a cohesive message. And uh, so we've done two things collectively recently. Um, over the last year, we did create a slate of arts and COVID-19 policy asks. Uh, and I have to say um, what happened uh, due to the online nature of advocacy now is just amazing. For ad it's, I, it's democratized the process in a way that has never happened before. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do a fly in to Washington. You don't have to do a hill day to be heard. You can have a meeting just like we are right now. Ask for a meeting just like this one on Zoom with the staff in your elected officials office. And that's essentially what happened. And it's what groups like NEVA were brilliant around organizing. Um, and I think it's also, uh, once you've done that once, and once you've had those conversations, it's really, you quickly realize that you are the expert in your issue area. You know more than the elected officials and their staff do about this policy and that 
really what they need to do and what they ultimately often do is regard you as their expert on arts issues. So, um, you know, what we try to do at the national level is provide advocates with information to inform those engagements, let them know when it's the sweet spot for making that outreach, and uh, then keep monitoring what the needs are. And I would say, you know, there are kind of two really important things for advocates to be doing right now. And one is set those relationships with those offices because they're, they're early still in the new Congress and the new administration, and they're impressionable. So, you know, going in first to let them know who you are and what the needs of your community are really important. And the other is to just really start taking note of the unmet needs, especially when it comes to COVID relief. Uh, mark those, make sure we're communicating about those. I think that's such an important point. And, and I think, I mean, you made like three points that I think are super important to, to emphasize. I think one is on that access point, policymakers love to hear from the arts community. It's not a matter of access, it's a matter of what you do with the access. And, you know, for, you know, those Hill jobs by and large are awful jobs. I mean, you know, those staffers work so hard and it's not easy work. And when they have an opportunity to get into a different headspace for 45 minutes to think about what's happening in their cultural sector at home or in the district, they're, they're typically super excited to have that opportunity. And, you know, I think something that you just emphasized, something I heard you just say, like, we don't always have to have the solution, right? We just need to know what's happening in our community, in, in our sector, in our industry. We need to be able to share that with authenticity and create that relationship where you're the expert that they want to come back to you and say, hey, we're thinking about doing X, Y, Z. How would this impact you? Would this be helpful or not? And, and there are definitely times when the field has a solution or has a specific thing they're pushing. But oftentimes, if you don't, you know, it, it's based on having that relationship, which doesn't always have to be, you know, we need X, Y, Z. It's more like just know what we're up to. And, and, and I do think Zoom has completely unlocked that because in, in my experience, you know, doing this work for 22 years, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the issue is who's on tour and has time to go to the Hill, you know, and if you can do it from, from home, you know, that's, you know, so much the better. Um, so I really appreciate you, you making those points. Um, the, uh, yeah, talk about, I mean, what was your, you know, again, as someone who's done this work for a minute, uh, what, what was it like for you to observe this online explosion last year? And, and these organizations cropping up in a hyper sort of entrepreneurial way. I mean, were you and your colleagues, what, what, I mean, I'm just curious, like, how do you process that? Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just speak for myself. I, I think it was dreamy. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of times, you know, we feel we have to convince people that, um, that the Congress works for them, right. you know, that, that, that they, you know, they're, that it only works really if their stakeholders are engaged. Um, so to see a whole sector say, I belong at this table, yeah. you know, and, and claim their seat at it, I think was fantastic and, and is now. And also I'd say uh, the other thing is that usually when we do these episodic events, like a, a day or a week, you know, a couple of years go by before people think about doing it again. I think that artists now see this work as part of their job description. Yeah. And, and that, that means that it won't just be a moment of arts policy being made, that this is something that should just keep going on. Yeah. And, you know, kind of what you were saying about um, getting to know policymakers, um, one of the best things you can do is show up at one of their town halls that has nothing to do with the arts and be there to listen to what the priorities are, and then to tell them that the arts and the creative sector workforce is the answer to that priority. Mm -hmm. You know, it's to, to have the arts showing up in every space, whether it's the Department of Treasury or the Department of Defense, you know, there, there's really, just like the arts are in every part of our life, they show up in every part of policymaking as well. So when I, you know, you see this activity, you think this is, this is it, this is the time that it gets locked in. Yeah, let, let's dig in on that a little bit. And, and that dovetails really nicely with a, a question Delogue Smith just put in the chat, you know, around this idea of how do we keep arts, um, you know, inside the kind of conversation about wider human need and economic activity instead of just kind of siloed as arts. 
And I mean, I've got some thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear your take on, on what you're anticipating uh, from the Biden administration, what you'd like to see from the administration. And, and also maybe I know you're working on some recommendations and some things that you would like to see them in terms of approach. Could you speak a little bit about that, that kind of holistic nature of arts in every conversation? Sure. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts first, Michael. But I think I, I think I heard you say a couple things earlier that might kind of hint at it. Um, but you know, the idea really is going back to what you were talking about. What does it mean to build back better? Mm-hmm. Which I'll just say for orchestras, you know, they're thinking about this in terms of their culture. You know, which is something that you know Dessa talked about. You know, what does it mean to build your culture back better? What does it mean to build your partnerships back better? Um, And so, you know, we're at a moment where the the country is having a conversation about what does it mean to build back better? Uh, We've got an administration whose priorities are, um, you know, economic recovery, climate change, racial equity, a response to the COVID-19 process. And I think the path forward is that we say the arts are a part of all of those conversations um, and we show up that at them. And so this um, transition document effort you've mentioned is uh, across many dozens, national groups, regional and state ones as well, uh, articulating where we think the arts fit into all of those parts of federal policy. Uh, So we've been working on that, um, give an early glance at it to the Biden team as it was transitioning in and now have a a longer version ready to roll uh, probably by the middle of next week. But the idea of of statements like these or platforms like these aren't that they do the job, right? It's just, it's something to kind of ground our collective efforts. Um, There will be more to do beyond what's on those pages, but the the biggest, uh, I think, goal for us is to show up everywhere where these policy conversations are happening. I think that's so smart, Heather. And I I think, I just want to echo your enthusiasm um, for just the, the, incredible blossoming of engagement and activism that we've seen and, you know, sectors coming together to work in good faith, to not be cynical about the process, to just, you know, understand what it means to do the work um, and to hopefully do it long-term and and understand again, you know, what I, I said earlier is that, you know, obviously everybody's in disaster relief mode because we have to be, but there are reasons that organizations exist like music policy forum and league of American orchestras and many others that, there are ongoing needs that we have to be engaging with. So this isn't kind of parachute in, get relief funding and, and get out. It's like, no, long-term, what does that sort of advocacy um, conversation and ecosystem look like? And, and, and you know, really, again, changing, I, I think to your point, changing, I mean, I think it's already happening. I think, I, I think the conversation is, has been changing for many years. And we saw a lot of this in, in sort of early signals of this in the Obama administration about understanding that, you know, arts and education, arts and housing policy, arts and, and, and public health, arts, you know, fit into all these different components. It just didn't get where it needed to get to during that administration. And then of course, the last four years, um, the Trump administration really wasn't engaged in, in any of those conversations at any level. And so it's kind of restarting what had kind of been growing over the eight years of the, of the Obama administration and seeing what it's gonna look like in practice in terms of, you know, what does it mean to have people in positions of power across the federal government that are that understand this and are thinking about this or are curious about it or want to see kind of how this all fits together. So, and, and that are artists and I that mean, are, let's, artists. Let's, let's have artists populate, you know, the policy yeah. scene. Let's, Absolutely. let's, let's get them elected. Let's, <laughs> you know, the, and, and to be honest, you know, the most convincing thing I've ever seen with policy leaders is when they actually see an arts engagement That's and right. participate in it firsthand. So huge That's opportunity right. there. That's right. Well, and, and if I can just jump in, one other thing that, that we haven't mentioned that I do think is important, and it's very important to everything that, that you guys have been doing, but also the arts and, and human flourishing. One thing I've noticed is I have a lot of students who, you know, weren't music students, but have discovered music in this and that they're learning to play instruments. I think we're going to have some bigger audiences and we need to, you know, you guys do such a great job of bringing all of that together. Yeah, and you know, one thing we haven't mentioned, yeah. Michael, that I expect, I, I think some of your prior conversations have surfaced, but, you know, things like universal broadband, um, yeah. building a, an infrastructure that supports what we know will be online activity for a while, um, you know, Dessa's point about how do we, how do we make that a sustainable practice, you know, 
I, I know I'm looking forward to learning from you uh, on how we can advance some of those asks as well. Yeah, and, and FCC Chair, um, Acting Chair Rosenworcel announced, uh, yes, I think this morning that they're doing a workshop on February 12th on how to implement, I think they have about three and a half billion dollars of, of funding of broadband access grants. So they're starting to get their head together at the FCC about what that looks like in practice. I mean, all these things are just coming together at a breathtaking pace. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about, which we need to, which is less aspirational and more just nitty gritty is how you're seeing the rollout of, of the Saver Stages or the Shuttered Venue Operators uh, grants, um, how that's going particularly for your sector and kind of what are you anticipating that might look like over the next six months in terms of $15, $15 billion worth of funding? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's like an hour long conversation yeah. on its own, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, well, long story short, uh, hit the refresh on the shuttered venue operators grants program just as often as you can. Yep. So SBA has six personnel administering a $15 billion program, and they received 7,500 email questions on this topic. <laughs> and I can tell you they are doing, you've heard this, I think last week too, they are doing, and you said it at the top, they're doing their absolute best to try to get clear information about how to access this program. Um, they issued an FAQ, as you mentioned, but we've also heard that they're going to keep adjusting this guidance Mm -hmm. And the reason is they want to be responsive to the stakeholders who are mm -hmm. actually going to use the funds. They want to make sure that this works exactly the way, you know, you would hope it would, is accessible, um, goes to, you know, in, in the right time frame, in the right places. So unfortunately, I think it's going to require more patience to watch this guidance roll out. It won't be done tomorrow or three days from now. Um, and meanwhile, it's a real challenge because um, you have to choose between the Paycheck Protection Program or this grant option. There are risks, you know, involved if you don't know how the eligibility criteria work. So I, I think the thing I would just say is to um, keep reading the guidance, the official guidance that you see from the SBA, um, and then really know what your needs are and uh, start gathering, as, especially for independent artists, um, as much as you can do to start gathering financial information from both 2020 and 2019. Um, and then if you think that you might be tapping the Shuttered Venues program, go on to grants.gov and understand what it means to get registered there. You can do that in advance, even if you don't ever end up applying, but it does take time. Yeah. Um, and it's something that you want to go ahead and set in motion now as we wait for the final guidance. And one final question is a big picture question. Um, so, and this isn't really doing it. So just as a thought exercise. So if one of the challenges of our field for a long time has been the sort of sense that maybe a 5% increase to decrease in NEA funding is some sort of proxy for cultural policy, right? I mean, a lot of energy has gone into you know, kind of smaller, more targeted things. Of course, we love the NEA, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not about the NEA. It's just that that's sort of been a lot of the type of things that that our sector has, has sort of asked for politically. And then you have this thunderbolt in obviously an unprecedented moment of crisis where you can combine, again, all 50 years of NEA funding and NEH funding together, and it still doesn't get to $15 billion, right? So you go from like this low kind of target investment to this massive investment. We need this investment to go well. And beyond, we need, need it to go well. We need to be perceived as going well. So it's not a one-term, you know, one-time only thing that just happened, but it, it's, a, it's a change in sort of the thinking in terms of, of how we align public resources with the art, arts and cultural sector. Could you, like, what are you thinking in terms of, you know, let's just say they spend out the money, we get to some sort of recovery, as many venues are able to stay open and as can be, you know, I mean, like, let's just say it, it works or it works as well as it can, given the, you know, sort of unprecedented nature of the experiment. Now we're a year down the road, what are you hoping is sort of the takeaway from that experience on Capitol Hill in the administration? What can we as advocates do to sort of be guiding that thinking or anticipating that thinking moving forward? Does that question even make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think it does because, I mean, you're talking about the difference between being in an a, a emergency relief posture and being on the long-term policy agenda. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the, the way the arts are seen now that should be durable 
um, is that it's a, a massive sector of creative workers that, that aren't just in one place or one kind of industry, but are across our economy um, and serve our communities in multiple ways, right? Um, that, I think that's being seen now. Um, also, you know, look, I'm, I'm never a fan that our economic impact is our best argument, um, but it also is an important tool to convince policy leaders why the, this should rise to the priority level for them. Um, and I think that's something that also is really sinking in is that there's this ripple effect when you've got creative activity, other things happen in a community that also, you know, matter to the community. So if we carry those two points forward consistently and we, we, and we identify all of the places, whether it's workforce development or public education um, or telecommunications uh, where the arts show up, um, if you were to add up the collective federal investment in all of those agencies, it could triple $15 billion if it's done right, right? We, we also have to track where the policy is connecting to us. So it's a piece of work we have to do on the other side as well. Yeah. That's um, really well stated. And we have a lot of work ahead of us. We Everybody does. And it's going to be exhausting and exhilarating and fun, maybe, hopefully, um, and different. Um, but we just so appreciate, you know, the work that you and, and all your colleagues do and, and the broader network of advocates that have been doing this work for a long time. Um, and, and super appreciative of you spending time with us today. Um, we're at time, so we're, we're going to have to wrap up here. Um, next week, though, next week's program, we'll be sure to share the um, recommendations to the administration uh, and make sure everybody has a link to that that's interested in, in getting, um, you know, a copy of what you guys are up to. So with that, we are going to bring this to close again. Um, thank you so much, Heather and Dessa and Anna uh, for joining us and Alex Dolvin for producing, doing a great job as always. Thank you all for your great questions and, and comments and feedback. Again, if you have questions, concerns, suggestions, constructive feedback, all that good stuff, always hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. We'll be back next uh, week on February 5th with another uh, edition and I hope everybody has a safe and fun and pleasant weekend. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.